it does take a little bit of practice, but there are a few different ways that you can do it. Uh, but I'll get into that in just a, in just a minute. First thing you want to do is you want to kind of pick out your blank, and uh, this is a blank I picked. It's just a piece of glued up cherry. There are three little pieces of cherry in there. And um, I just cut the ends off, and hey, it's a blank. Um, you don't really need a huge, a huge, huge, okay, a huge blank to, uh, to start off. Just something little like this. Um, if you're new to wood turning, uh, before you mount a blank, a really good idea is to mark centers. Um, what I usually do is I'll usually just take a ruler and I'll, and I'll just hold it across there and uh, I'll just go from corner to corner and I'll make a line in the middle. Then I'll go to the other, other side or the other corner to corner, make another mark like so to where I have an X and that X is about center. Does it have to be exact, exactly in the center? No. You know, we're going to turn away all that stuff and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really not a big deal. The other thing you can use is one of these, you know, one of these cool doodads called the center finder. Center finder you just put right there on the, uh, on the corner, make your mark going one way, go the other side and make your mark the other way. And if you're really, really particular about wanting to find the center, then you can do it the, on the other, on the other uh, two corners as well and get yourself like a, a super pre zack center. And so I would just kind of shoot for, you know, somewhere in that area. But like I said, it really doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, after you get your centers marked, then just go ahead and mount it into your uh, mount it into your lathe between centers. This is again how I how I like to do this. Um, if your chuck is big enough, or if your blank is small enough, you can just go ahead and take this guy and just mount it directly into your chuck. But um, I like to do it a particular way, and that's just kind of the way I do it. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and take this guy, stick it in here. Like so, bring up your tailstock, lock your tailstock down, index your live center in, and uh, tighten that guy down a little bit. This is kind of fun. I, uh, I never really get a chance to use this lathe. I like this lathe a lot. If you ever get a chance to use this lathe, do it. If you don't, well, no big deal. Okay, so um, this is a spindle right now. Whenever you guys are turning a spindle, whenever you're first roughing a spindle, you want to make sure you're using a spindle roughing gouge. Uh, you can also use a bull gouge. You can use a scraper. You can use uh, a bazillion different types of tools to get this to get this done. Uh, but I only bring up the spindle gouge thing because if you're doing a bowl, which is edge grain, you don't want to use this guy in there. Although I saw some crazy German guy on YouTube the other day using one of these to turn a bowl. You know, those crazy German guys. So, I'm just going to go ahead and make this guy round because that's the first thing you do whenever you're turning wood. You make it round. So, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to give a, get a pretty good amount of speed going on this guy because it's relatively small. Um, and I'm just going to see what's got, what I got going on here. Yeah, you, Roger. Look, I learned from Roger. I was watching him one day whenever we were making tops over at Glenn's, and uh, he was he had his he had his uh, gouge angled to where he wasn't throwing chips all in his face. And uh, I thought that was kind of a rather smart thing to do. So guess what I started doing? I started doing what Roger does. That's always been my motto, anyway. Just do what Roger does. And so it doesn't really matter. Just as long as you kind of get this guy around, you have all the flat spots out of there. So I still have a flat spot there. So we don't have to get too particular on that. So the next thing I do after I get it round, the next thing I do after I get it round is um, is I'll figure out how big I want my end to be to fit into my chuck. Now this kind of looks like it's going to be looks like it's going to fit pretty pretty closely. I left my I left the end of this guy in here from the uh, from the one I turned earlier today. <laughs> Look familiar like that. So 
Um, but I like this tendon so much on the end of this guy that I'm going to see if I can if I can uh, match that size onto this guy. And it, the way it's kind of looking, I might have gone a little bit too small. But we're going to find out. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, well, I still have a little bit of room on this end. So I'm going to work on this end a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to switch over to my roughing gouge. I'm pretty well done with my roughing gouge. Uh, my roughing gouge, again, is just to kind of, just to kind of make it round. So I'm going to work in this, uh, I'm going to work in this end down here a little bit. Move my tool rest over. And I want, I want a shoulder on here that's pretty square. I want a shoulder on here that's pretty square. I think that's going to do it for me. Um, on a bigger blank, I like to, I like to have some kind of a, I like to have some kind of a shoulder. I'm sorry, my tenon. I want my tenon to be, you know, to be eh, about yay deep. And I usually I like to have a shoulder on here because whenever you guys are turning in end grain, this guy is going to vibrate, and uh, vibration is bad because the more it vibrates, the more chatter you get, and uh, before you know it, you know, it starts chattering, 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 and uh, you end up with a funnel. Not that I know that personally or anything like that, but it has happened before, believe it or not. So I'm going to take that guy, and I'm going to go ahead and mount it in my chuck, and uh, man, I really wish I had a bigger shoulder on this, but we do, we do, we do what we can with what we have. And I think we're going to be just, just fine here. Might be a little wobbly coming out of the gate, but that's okay. Because uh, I think I had the tools to fix that right here. Crank her down. Um, if you've uh, got any strength in your hands, you know, you really want to put the clamps in this guy. Because if this comes off of here, or if it comes loose while you're turning, then you're pretty much just going to have to start over. Uh, where's a knockout bar from this guy? Look at that blue lock. That's where I'm going. There it is. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and mount this guy on the lathe. I'm going to turn my speed down. Um, speed is pretty gosh darn important too. Yeah, we're a little wobbly. So I'm going to go ahead and bring my tailstock back up just to, just to kind of help round this guy out a little bit. You know that roughing gouge I said you didn't need anymore? Well, we need it again. So I'm just going to kind of, just to where we're a little bit smooth. Stock off again. And I don't think I'm going to need this anymore. I don't think I'm going to need this anymore. That's my problem sometimes. I think too much, so I just stopped. Okay, now, next couple tools that I'm going to kind of work with are these little guys. And uh, I can thank Mike Short for this. Um, Mike Short, who's, who's not here right now, he had, uh, he had other engagements. Mike Short is the guy who, who introduced me to these guys right here. These guys right here are called spindle gouges. If you don't have a spindle gouge, and if you've never learned how to use one, um, they, they're, a, they're a rather menacing beast to kind of start off with. But once you kind of learn how to use it, he's making faces at me. It's like, for regular average idiots. <laughs> They're kind of a menacing beast to use, you know. But once you get the hang of them, um, they're they're still pretty cool. You know, occasionally they'll kind of come back and bite you if you don't pay attention to what you're doing. But uh, I really, really like using spindle gouges for this. I have two sizes here. I have a uh, I have a three eighths and I have a half inch. I'm going to use the the larger one, the half inch one, to kind of to work on this guy. Um, 
Now, Craig would probably use a carbide tool. Am I correct, Craig? You would use a carbide tool on this? Yeah. It depends. Um, you, can, you can use a carbide tool. You can use a scraper. Believe it or not, I scraped out a few of these things back whenever I was young and dumb. Um, now I'm just dumb. And so I, uh, this is kind of what I do with it now. And hey, did I ever mention that I'm not an expert at this? This is just, this is just fun. Yeah, so, yeah, what the heck. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this guy back on. Now I'm a little crooked again, but that's okay. We don't care about that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take this, uh, take this guy and even up my face or my end. Because I'm not gonna do one of them fancy ones. So it's kind of nice and easy. With this tool, with this tool, presentation is everything because you have this thing presented at the wrong angle whenever you're going into that thing. Like I said, it's gonna come back and bite you. I don't like things to bite me. So we're just gonna we're just gonna kind of keep it cool. I just said like Okay, so if you're using a carbide tool, if you're using a scraper, you can just go ahead and take your carbide tool or your scraper and just kind of dig on in. But you need to be careful because with all this sticking out right here, with all this sticking out right there, there's going to be a lot of vibration. There's going to be a lot of vibration. So um, if you have a cutting tool rather than a scraping tool, which I guess carbide does cut, doesn't it? I don't really know much about carbide. Some do. So if you have a tool that cuts rather than scrapes, um, it's going to be it's going to be a better finish for you. Now, everything you know about bowl turning, you can just throw out the window right now. Not everything. It's just a little bit backwards. With the bowl, you're usually going to you're going to start somewhere you know somewhere off the center, and you're going to dig in toward the center. With a uh, with a with a goblet or some kind of a, some kind of an ingrain thing. Whenever you're using a spindle gouge, you want to start at the center and work your way out. Okay? So just to kind of show you what that looks like, just to kind of show you what that looks like, I'm going to kind of turn my spindle gouge just on the edge a little bit. I'm just going to kind of start scooping it out. About like that, you can already hear it kind of vibrating a little bit. But that's okay. We don't care. It looks like we're working above center. Mm. Yeah. Pretty close on center. No, I'm working on center. I like to make sure that whenever my, whenever I set my tool, my uh, my spindle gouge, I'm going to be working above center whenever I come over here. But whenever I'm whenever I'm going in, and I'm glad you brought that up. You need to make sure whenever you're using a spindle gouge and going into end grain, make sure that you are right at center. Because if you're not at center, um, if you're going to be sent for a ride with this little guy. Okay. So, and yeah, I always end up with a little nubbin in the middle of that. And uh, and <laughs> Joe Schumacher, I think he's he uh, he's like, why don't you just take a drill bit and you know just drill it out first? Well, I always forget that, and so I just kind of, you know, I just do it this way. It doesn't matter. It all gets done. So I'm just going to go ahead and just keep on digging this guy out. Uh, I guarantee you that I'm probably going to end up with with this guy sailing off into one direction or another. If I just keep on going in and going in and going in. Until, uh, until I'm at the depth that I want. There was a guy on YouTube like that. There was a guy on YouTube, as my voice cracks, who, uh, who has a method where he goes in, he goes in and then he kind of takes the, uh, takes the spindle gouge and he goes up and up and over. I never really figured out exactly how he did that. Um, this, this method works perfectly mediocre for me, so I'm sticking with it. You know you're doing okay whenever you don't have a whole lot of vibration. And uh, 
you know, for demonstrational purposes, I probably should have chose a softer wood. But that's just the way it goes. Now, as long as this blank is, I'm not going to turn the entire thing into a goblet. I think. <laughs> so I'm just going to kind of, I don't know, I just kind of go and see what looks good. You know, if I was, uh, if I was really cool and I would have like this really long, thin, you know, sixteenth of an inch diameter stem on the end of that thing, and you know, I would have about eighteen rings, you know, trapped on there and everything. But uh, I have, I'm not cool. Haven't been since middle school, and so I'm just going to kind of do. Cool in school, right? but, but I what? You were cool in middle school. Well, well, you know, <laughs> I'm a legend in my own head. So okay, so uh, that's about where I'm going to stick with that guy. Um, for time's sake, I'm just going to kind of go ahead and start working on the rest of it. Now, out here on the uh, out here on the outside. Now, on the outside, I like to work just a, you know I like to work above center. I like to take my tool rest and put it a little bit above center. Um, it just works for me. If it works for you, then hey. If it doesn't work for you, then then don't do it. Um, it's this is just kind of something that I sort of picked up as I was kind of messing around with some of this stuff. Man, I'm gonna end up real thin out here on the end. Now, I'm kind of a little bit out of round, so I'm gonna try and fix that. Now, whenever you're using a spindle gouge. You always want to make sure that you're working downhill. Whenever I say downhill, with a spindle gouge, you really want to be going like down into a valley. You don't want to be coming up out of a cut because if you come up out of a cut, uh, it's going to come back and bite you. So what I, what I mean by that is I'll take my I'll take my spindle gouge and I start off about like this, and I don't really care where this is right now. I'll pay attention to that later. This is a little loosey goosey. You ever notice that? I'll just start right here, and I'll take my gouge, I'll rub my bevel, and I'll just kind of tip in just a little bit. And then I'll come over here on the other side, and I'll tip in a little bit. Then I'll come back over here, and I'll tip in just a little bit, and I'll just make that valley, make that valley deeper, make that valley wider, until I'm at the depth that I want. Now, I'm going to go ahead and shut the lathe off for this next part, you know, for showing you. I'm going down and in like this, and while I'm doing that, I'm rotating, I'm rotating the tool while I'm lifting up the handle. You know, if it's kind of a, it's kind of a practice thing. The entire time, I'm trying to make sure that I'm rubbing my bevel, um, which is kind of a basic tenant of of wood turning. You always want to make sure that you're as close to rubbing your bevel as you can possibly get. You're going to get a smoother cut, cleaner cut, better control of your tool, um, and plus you look good doing it. So I'm going to go ahead and keep on keep on doing this. Um, I'm just going to keep on working this down. And I'm going to kind of keep on feeling where I'm at. And uh, just kind of keep on working that valley. Make that valley deeper, make that valley wider. And kind of work on the inside edge of that, or the outside of that bowl. Um, ideally, I would make this rim the same all the way down and about as thin as I dare, which tonight I really don't dare to make it too thin because, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to explode something right here in front of you guys because that would just be silly. Okay, so right here I'm also starting to waste away where my stem is going to end up eventually. You guys ever get into that mode where you're like, I'm going to make one last cut. <laughs> that was my one last cut, so I survived. Okay, so now that I'm kind of getting a little farther down in there, I'm going to kind of lower my tool rest just a little bit. It's kind of feeling a little, get, you know, you kind of start getting that ooky feeling, you know, right around in here. Um, listen to the ooky feeling because the ooky feeling will keep you out of will keep you out of trouble a lot of times. We're 
Charles said that to me earlier. Um, I learned that in teacher school. So I'm going to kind of come in like this and just start wasting away a little bit, a little bit down toward my stem. Now I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go all the way down. I'm not going to go all the way down to the, uh, to the final diameter of the stem because I want to make sure that I finish, that I finish my, uh, my cup before I go into anything else. And why don't I want to finish my, you know, why do I want to finish my cup now? Well, whenever you're standing on this thing, there's going to be a lot of stress. A lot of stress on this guy out here, especially kind of the way I stand because I'm kind of an aggressive sander. And uh, I know I really should stop that sometimes, but it's just kind of the way I, way I do it. I, uh, I'm starting off with 80 grit here because my cuts are never, never very clean. Um, as Roger once referred to this, my 80 grit roughing gouge. Oh, that was funny. Come on. Uh, <laughs> Roger, one of my, one of my great mentors over there. I give him way too much trouble. Hopefully I give him more credit than I give him trouble because he's a great wood turner, as are a lot of the other guys in here. And I just got to talk about something to fill up time because sanding is really boring. Isn't this the stuff that Tim Yoder always like cuts out? How interesting is Tim Yoder while he's sanding? But anyway, like I said, you want to sand this because Whenever I start getting this real thin, you know, really putting some pressure on that is uh, is not a good thing because you just twist that thing off. Um, not that I know that from personal experience either. Just gonna work my way up through the grits here, 80, 100, 150. We're not gonna get too crazy. We're just gonna do it good enough. For those of you guys who are playing along, you know, at home, you guys can do a little bit better than what I'm doing here. Have I mentioned I'm not an expert at this? Yeah, I got all kinds of sanding scratches in here. Oh man. If I were grading my kids on this, I'd make them sand it again. 80, 100, 150. For those of you guys who are new to wood turning, whenever you guys are sanding, you really want to make sure that you keep your sandpaper moving. If you keep your sandpaper in just one spot, you're going to end up cutting grooves in your uh, in your workpiece. And if you end up cutting grooves in your workpiece, you know, of course, with a lot of things that's you know a lot of things that are fun, it's really not the end of the world. But you kind of get a little bit of a better a better look to it if you can get all of those all of those sanding scratches out of there. So I'm going to go up to 220 here. I'm not going to get crazy. Um, I almost never sand past 220 because, I don't know, I just don't. <laughs> if you want to sand this up to 12,000, be my guest. But I like 220. Sometimes if I'm, if I'm feeling spunky that day, I'll take some steel wool or some, uh, some non-woven abrasive pad like some, you know, maroon scotch pride or something like that and run it after this and uh, make it really super cool and stuff, but uh, I didn't bring any of that with me tonight. So we're just gonna quit at 220. Um, at this point, at this point you can make a decision. If you're just gonna throw some polyurethane over the top of this guy, then you can just go ahead and start working on the stem. Uh, I'm not. I like, to, uh, I like to put just a little bit of something, something on there. Uh, oftentimes it's friction polish, but I didn't have any friction polish because all the friction polish I have is gone. Um, and I didn't have a chance to make any new, so I'm just going to take a little bit of boiled linseed oil and, uh, and stick it on this guy. Which is pretty. I like it. It's a simple finish. Really brings out the brown of that cherry real nice. The brown red. And again, whenever you go and play along at home, you can, you can put whatever finish on here that you'd like. Ain't that cute? 
sometimes I just, you know, really, yes, thank you, thank you. You guys think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing all this for you. Really, I'm just doing this for my own entertainment. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put my tool rest back up above center just a little bit. I'm going to scoot it in just a little bit. And uh, I'm going to start working on that stem. Um, now, the stem is going to be, it's kind of like an easy bit of a challenge because you don't, you can make it as thin or as thick as you want. Um, I made them pretty thin uh, successfully. I made them pretty thin unsuccessfully. Um, that's, I guess, kind of a thick stem. If you're talking to, uh, talking to Paul over here, um, we don't even want to talk, you know, to him, thick is like an eighth of an inch. And so we're not really going to listen to what he says tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and start removing, removing all of this down here. And I'm going to kind of keep it simple. Uh, you can put what kind, you know, any kind of little decorations on this thing that you want. You can do a captured ring on there. Uh, you can, I don't know, you know, carve the carve the face of the Madonna in there if you choose to. It doesn't really matter what you do. Sorry, I didn't rotate. I didn't rotate and lift. Yeah, I didn't rotate and lift. I think. Uh, I just kind of keep on going down until I'm like, okay, well that looks like a good spot to put my base. Well, that looks like a good spot to put my base. So I'm going to go ahead and start working from there on my on my stem. Okay? So I'm just going to kind of keep on working on that taper a little bit. I'm going to kind of come in from the other side. And this is kind of where I start to get a little, a little confused. I'm going to lower my tool rest a little bit. Um, this is a real tough part for me. Have I mentioned that I'm not an expert at this? And uh, what I'll do is I'll just kind of get in here and I just kind of start dragging down a little bit with this spindle gouge. I mean, you can really get in there, but it's really, I'm sure there's a better way to do this. And I like to leave a little bit of a shoulder right there, just because it's what I do. Again, you can do whatever you want to do. Whenever I cut that little shoulder in there, I'll take the, take the uh, spindle gouge and roll it all the way over to where the flute is, uh, is pretty much vertical. And that's just, again, that's just what I do. I'm not talking during this part because this is, uh, you can tell whenever something gets hard, I quit talking. Okay, so now that that hairy scary part was all over, is all good with. So I'm going to kind of, I don't know, just kind of eyeball it. And, uh, you know, if that kind of looks good to me, I'm going to take out my, my trusty little parting tool. And uh, I'm going to kind of work out here a little bit. And I'm like, if that looks like it's a good height for it, then I'll go ahead and I'll remove a little bit more. But if I think it needs to be a little bit shorter, then I'll just come in, I'll just come in a little bit farther. I'll come in a little farther and you know just make it a little bit shorter. But I'll usually start out here a little a little ways and kind of work my way in. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be okay. Okay. So I'll start wasting away this material in here. Whenever I do this, whenever I do this, I don't just take my parting tool and just go straight in. I like to take my parting tool and kind of angle it angle it up and in a little bit like this. I angle it up and in a little like that so that whenever I put this cup on whatever flat surface it's going to go on, um, only the rim only the rim of this guy is going to be touching and so it's always going to sit flat. Whereas if I try and go straight in, there's almost always that little nub that's sticking down. I didn't finish the bottom of this one, but there's almost, for me, there's always that little nub sticking down and whenever you put it down on the table, it'll start going, you know, ooh, like a weeble. You know, they wobble. Thank you. Thank you, token heckler. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of work in a little bit. I like to give myself a lot of room. You got those guys that have those, you know, 16th inch parting tools, you know, 32nd inch parting tools, 128th inch parting tools. 
I just like this guy. You know, I like to use a club as a parting tool, but it, uh, it kind of requires a little bit of room. So I'm just going to kind of go down about yay far. We're going to stop right there, and I'm going to go ahead and go back to go back to sanding. I tell my kids at school that whenever I make something on the lathe. I'll spend, you know, X number of minutes, uh, you know, actually turning it, and then I'll spend about four times that sanding that. The kids don't always like to hear that because they want things, you know, they want things done. They want it now. The lathe is about as close as you can get to that. The lathe is about as close to instant, instant gratification as you can get in woodwork, which I think is why it's probably so popular with, with kids. You know, this is the stuff I think about whenever I'm in the classroom, you know, instead of like teaching and stuff. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, start sanding this guy again. I'm not going to mess too much with my little shoulder up here, uh, not with the 80 grit paper, but I'm going to go ahead and use the 100, 150, 220 on that. Occasionally, yes. In some in some countries, sandpaper is actually used as currency, um, and you know the rougher grits, you know, are obviously obviously lower lower grade than the higher grits because it takes more, you know, to get that. I'm completely lying, so don't believe that. <laughs> Chuck Norris toilet paper, right there. Actually, I think it's a cheese grater, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I lost my 100 grit paper. Hey, when that happens, it's all fun games until you lose your 100 grit paper. Yeah, hell with it. I'll use it. <laughs> Let's use the worn out section 80. How does that sound? That's the same stuff, isn't it? Go. Try to keep you awake, folks. I know that I know that the mood lighting in here is tough to tough to kind of sit through. And I'm up here sweating myself, you know, sweating. Do I look bigger on TV? I do. Taller. You look more handsome. I'm more handsome. More handsomer. That's really not a hard job. <coughs> Anything that obscures my face usually makes me more handsome. <laughs> Standing. You know, one of these days, there's going to be somebody out there who comes up with, comes up with a wood turning tool. That's, they're going to claim you never need to sand whatever it is you're turning. Skew one of these chisel. days, huh? Skew chisel. Skew. Okay. I forgot. <laughs> the skew chisel, of course. Yeah. Everybody knows how to use one of those too. Okay. So I think that's going to that's going to do us for that. I'm going to go ahead and get my linseed oil again. And I'm just gonna 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 kind of dab a little bit on that guy, um, just to bring out a little bit of the color on that on that cherry. And these are just the cutest darn little things. I'll make these guys at school. Guys, if you're looking to pick up chicks, this is it right here. <laughs> Not high school girls. You're <laughs> <laughs> talking about real chickens, huh? <laughs> you go over to Buckeye and get those two. That's right. <laughs> yeah, this is a real lady killer right here. So, okay. All right. I think uh, I think that looks okay. Let me go ahead and clear this off of here. Bring my tool rest back. 
one final time. And uh, hey guys, you know that ooky feeling I was talking about earlier? Well, I'm kind of starting to get that because now I got to get this sucker off the lathe. This is always, always the fun part. How do, this would be like its own professional sport. How to how to remove a turned object from a lathe without banging it into the tool rest. So I'm just going to kind of work this thing down, work that little work that little stub in there down and as thin as I dare. If I was really cool and if I wasn't such a tight wad, I would pull this back a lot farther and I would use my spindle gouge to really get in there. But uh, I'm a tight wad. I don't know, I just don't like to uh, waste wood where I can. I don't like to waste wood where it can still be used. I really don't know what the kids at school think of me. Okay, whenever it starts wobbling a little bit, better get your hand on it. So I kind of like to wrap my hand around it, uh, protect it from the tool rest, get my, uh, get my parting tool in one hand. And it's just all or nothing at this point. There we are, kids. Where's the camera? Where's the camera? Yeah. There we go. And that's it. I would say your baby days. I don't know, but I hear I'm going to be famous after this. Price goes up after tomorrow. So. Uh,